Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And yeah, as you just mentioned, I'll be talking about um, the work that we were doing in our group, uh, Computational Biology Center at IBM TG Watson, which is just a little bit up north. <laughs> um, the work is basically on trying to understand brain using machine learning. I know there have been lots of efforts recently on trying to use ideas about brain to improve machine learning, and we're kind of interested in improving brain using ideas from machine learning. <laughs> so I'm interested in artificial intelligence, but I'd rather improve natural. Anyway, uh, this work is definitely not just my work. It's done with many, many people, collaborators from my group and from other places, um, from universities and from hospitals. And this is just an incomplete list of all the people who contributed to this work. So let's start with brain imaging, classical setting, functional magnetic resonance. Unfortunately, I missed the talk this morning and I thought it was extremely interesting. It was also about um, functional MRI. So I hope, well, now I need to compete with this one. So we'll see. Maybe I have more colorful pictures, we'll see. Anyway, so you probably already heard about the basic settings in Functional MRI, just like an usual MRI, you put a person in a scanner and you just keep the person there, either not doing anything at its resting state of MRI or doing some task like reading sentences, listening to music, solving math problems, or uh, maybe you actually inflicting pain on people and trying to understand what's going on in their brain and so on. Uh, the thing is, okay, uh, just uh, for all practical purposes, we don't really need to know the physics of the process. It measures blood oxygen level dependent signal that is relevant to brain activity, but the relationship is very indirect. I will not go into that, but uh, it's kind of complicated. So what you see is not really activity of neurons. Each voxel, which is three millimeter by three millimeter by three millimeter or around that, contains millions of neurons. So it's very indirect measure of brain activity, we should keep it in mind. But it has relatively good combination of spatial and temporal resolution because it kind of scans your brain every one, two seconds and it gets this relatively small voxels. The challenge for uh, data analysts, whether you use classical approaches or machine learning techniques, the data are very high dimensional, you get up to 100,000 voxels but the number of samples is limited. So you have typically a few hundred uh, time, uh, time points, or if you compare subjects with certain diseases versus controls, you usually have less than 100 subjects in one particular study. So being high dimensional small sample is kind of the issue in this type of problems. So here is one example that's more fun, that comes from old uh, PBIC data competition, grad students play video games in a scanner, um, luckily it's fMRI not PET, there is no ionizing radiation going on, so you can put as many students as you want. Uh, things are measured during the game and things are also measured after the game, basically you ask them how they felt during particular episodes, whether they're anxious or happy or annoyed, what they were doing, uh, and basically you have other type of stimuli or responses, for example, listening to instruction telling you to do something in video game. And the questions you can ask here are, well, what brain areas were involved in listening to instructions? Or another question, can I actually predict when the instructions were on just by looking at the fMRI? So typical questions people ask in this type of problems. Another example is a little bit less fun. As I mentioned, you use also graduate students. You put them in a scanner and you inflict pain on them. And you can do that as a professor. Well, we just collaborate with our friends from different universities so we don't do it ourselves. Uh, so we just get the data. You have some relatively painful thermal stimulus, like a metal patch on your back. And the temperature goes up and down, up and down and um, subjects are asked to rate their pain perception and you get, for example, 14 samples on the right. Actually, it's interesting how differently people perceive pain and some of them quite accurately reproduce the stimulus and some of them, especially at the bottom, 
seem to be very tough. <laughs> well, the question remains whether they're really tough or they just don't feel anything, and <laughs> that's a very good question. Anyway, you may again start asking questions, what I can do with this data? Can I find pain relevant areas? Or can I actually predict their pain perception just by looking at their fMRI, things like that. So these type of questions are universal in fMRI studies and that's pretty much where the field started even before machine learning people came in there. So given a stimulus, maybe mental state in general, maybe mental disorder like schizophrenia, ADHD, autism, you name it. Can you find relevant brain areas? Can you find interactions or networks across those areas? And traditional neuroimaging approaches, again, before machine learning people came in there, were quite simplistic, so any neuroscientist and psychiatrist can understand them. They used univariate voxel correlations with a task or stimulus, and the correlations above threshold would be plotted on nice colorful map, usually published in all those kind of uh, popular scientific um, articles and science magazine and so on, areas relevant to the task are simply a result of univariate voxel correlation. So obviously uh, you can see that you completely ignore that voxels interact with each other, that the brain is actually a network. So as more reasonable alternative in the past decade, people are actively exploring multivariate predictive methods in functional MRI for predicting all kind of mental states from cognitive, like viewing pictures, listening to instructions, emotional, well, like feeling pain, being anxious, anxious and so on. And uh, especially interesting, biomarkers for mental disorders. And I will talk a little bit about each type of a prediction. I know I only have about 20 minutes left, so I'll probably have to go very quickly but I'll try to give you a gist of what we're doing in our group and what's going on in the field as well. The key, however, is that in this field, you are not just interested in good predictor, you're interested in understanding the brain. So you better use interpretable models and find predictive patterns rather than just use some black box predictors. So that's something to keep in mind. And that was our goal in the past well, seven years of working in CBC group. Your focus is not at on the classification accuracy or regression accuracy only. Your focus is on the middle point, which is those predictive patterns that you extracted from the brain data that made that accurate prediction happen. And we did various things starting with most obvious type of uh, methods that I will describe in a minute feature selection. So if you want to know where the activity related to task happening in the brain, you try to select for voxels that are highly informative about the task. And there is a wide range of feature selection techniques, but in the past, again, decade, the field of sparse modeling became extremely popular and useful because uh, you have efficient algorithms and you can handle large scale data. So I'll talk about sparse regression and sparse Markov networks in applications to fMRI. The next step is maybe the original voxels are not very good features and you need to look further. Maybe knowing something about the domain, like you look at schizophrenia, you know it's not a local disease. Schizophrenia is more like a disconnection of brain functioning. So you need to look for network patterns. You need to know what type of features to construct. And finally, I mean, that's a popular area in machine learning right now, automated feature extraction or learning representations. We also tried various things like dictionary learning, supervised dimensionality reduction, and we're kind of looking into deep learning. But again, when you do that, you need to keep in mind that you want your constructed features to be interpretable. Okay, so the simplest model you can imagine. What can you do? Let's, let's fMRI data be basically your design matrix and let's try to find the linear regression model, the coefficient beta, that can accurately predict the output, the response variable y, for example, the pain the person experiences. As I mentioned, the data are high dimensional, small sample, so simple linear regression, of course, won't work, it will overfit. 
anything unregularized will overfit, so you need to add some kind of constraints, regularization. At the same time, you want interpretable solutions that I mentioned. So embedded variable selection is a way to go here. So what is embedded variable selection? The classical example, as many of you probably know, is a lasso or sparse regression. All it does, it adds one little constraint to the linear regression formula formulation, the one in red, which geometrically looks like a diamond, and when it touches the objective function um, uh, levels, the objective function is in this case quadratic, some square difference between the output and the uh, kind of predicted output. Due to the property of those constraints, the sharp edges, it tends to select coefficients where there are many zeros. So in a sense, it selects variables. It's a classical method, it's old, plain, vanilla lasso, but unfortunately it has various draw drawbacks. For example, it never groups related variables together. If you have the whole brain area that participates in the task, uh, if the, all the voxels there are similarly relevant and highly correlated, a lasso tends to select one out of the group and it will show you as a solution like a salt and pepper picture on the brain which makes no sense. It's not what you want in terms of interpretability. So you need something with more structure besides just sparsity and there are various extensions of uh, the basic lasso such as group lasso, fused lasso. And particularly in this application we found very useful the method called elastic net. It adds extra regularizer, the uh, quadratic term, and it changes the shape of the constraint so that you still have sparsity because you keep L1, but you also enforce now the grouping effect so that correlated variables will have similar coefficients. They either grouped and include together or they excluded together. So this type of uh, structure makes perfect sense in this type of domain. And in general, that's one of the lessons you learn in biological applications and in brain imaging in particular. Adding proper structure prior is extremely important and you need to know what type of prior you add. With Elastic Net, we had very kind of good experiences. We had um, multiple applications to pain, to video game playing and other domains. And in general, Elastic Net was quite accurate in predicting the task or the stimulus. For example, you can up to 0 0.8 correlation with a true pain perception. You can predict it just by looking at the people's brain. So that's quite remarkable. At the same time, Elastic Net shows you clusters of voxels that predicted so well, and it's not salt and pepper. It's indeed regions in the brain. Also, because of the grouping, I'm not showing details here, they're of course in the papers, but it improves stability of the model, and that's another important property of machine learning kind of models in this domain. If you repeat the experiment for the same subject on a different day, you better make sure that the sparse model at least reminds you about the sparse model you learned yesterday. You will never have 100% kind of overlap, but you would like to have some reliability, some stability and reproducibility in your, in your models. It's very important kind of additional constraint. Uh, if you have some knowledge about groups that you want to keep together, like if somebody gives you uh, information about brain area, they have like very high prior, they say it should be there, you can use things like group lasso because you basically can specify which group should be included or excluded together. You can also use uh, techniques such as fused lasso, which basically enforces continuity, spatial or temporal. It basically tells you that not only sparsity is enforced, but also similarity between coefficients of nearby variables. Moreover, you can use uh, additional priors depending on what you're looking for in your problem in uh, sparse models beyond simple regression. Another example here is trying to learn sparse Markov networks. 
the problem is even if you take the off-the-shelf graphical lasso sparse Markov network method, it will build a, it, it, it enforces sparsity over the edges, over connections, but it will build something over the whole brain and it will be very hard to interpret that. Instead, what we did in one of our studies, we also tried to enforce variable selec selection combined with edge selection. So the way you do it is basically adding uh, group lasso regularizer on top of the graphical lasso, the sparse Markov network formulation. Again, I'm not going into details of that. The bottom line is, again, you use extra prior, extra hypothesis, something like you believe that there are relatively few voxels or areas and they're interacting with each other and they're forming a cluster that you would like to include and the rest of the voxels that are not really interacting with each other are not that relevant in this situation. So with this assumption or with this prior that will be enforced in form of group lasso constraint, you get something like that. So here you have a study on cocaine subjects versus controls, uh, quite relevant, was done here actually in uh, Mount Sinai, so they have plenty of subjects. <laughs> and we keep getting data every day. Um, yeah, so unlike one of the previous speakers, I'm not asking to contribute the data, although <laughs> it's possible. Bottom line here is, On the left, you have cocaine subjects. On the right, you have controls. If you use standard approach that finds a edge sparse network, at the bottom, you get a total mess. Even though it's sparse network, it's over the whole brain, all the voxels. You cannot tell what's going on. If you enforce the group regularizer, the block L1, L2, on the sparse network learning, you get the two networks at the, at the top. And then you can actually take a closer look. I will not go into details, but you can actually find some interesting interpretable differences between the addicts and controls, especially in the context of the task they were doing. It was some a monetary reward task, and it has something to do with how the rewards are processed in prefrontal cortex and how the preprocessing changes in cocaine addicts. So they kind of value usual things less because there is something else they value more. Okay, so that was kind of the first lesson that is probably quite common sense, but if you have good prior knowledge in your domain, you better use it instead of just blindly going with some plain vanilla lasso, plain vanilla graphical, uh, sparse graphical models because you may need that prior to get more meaningful solutions. Well, another lesson we learned also was that sometimes, again, if you know uh, something about your domain and you can come up with some analytical model for part of the domain, it may be useful to combine it with purely data-driven model. Uh, I know the slide is a little bit too dense, so I'll just try to talk about that quickly, but if you remember the slide on pain perception, we had this huge intersubject variability uh, in how people actually perceive the same uh, stimulus. The interesting thing is you can actually come up with a very simple, just first order uh, dynamical model with only three parameters and you pretty much capture all, all those subjects. The model connects stimulus temperature to pain perception without the brain, just those two things. It's kind of interesting, you pretty much have a brain print of each person saying that three parameters make you tough guy or something like that. <laughs> so if you now combine this with data-driven approach and from fMRI you predict the stimulus because it's not always the case that you know what caused the pain. You may not have the stimulus, you don't know the temperature. You use data-driven sparse regression approach to predict from fMRI that stimulus and you use extremely accurate analytical model to map that to the perception. Overall model was more, um, even though it was going through like a hidden variable, it was overall more uh, accurate than a direct prediction from data to uh, pain uh, perception. And that's pretty much the lesson here, that sometimes it's worth 
yeah, it's worth going over the hidden variable. Okay, looks like I really have to speed up now. Um, okay, one more lesson quickly. Even though you may love sparsity, it doesn't mean that you have to be completely fixated on that because you may discover interesting things that some problems are indeed sparse. For example, on the left, it was a simple auditory task that I mentioned in some video game. And after you remove first sparse solution and try to find another sparse solution, maybe still predictive, but after you remove a few, the rest of the brain seem to be irrelevant to the task. So it's truly sparse localized task. In other cases like pain, if you keep looking and keep throwing away your sparse solutions, you still, find it, you still keep finding very pretty good solutions, very accurately predicting, not as good as the first one. So the gradation of performance on the right is very slow. Essentially, the brain is kind of holographic. So the information about pain is everywhere. And that's something you will never see with standard correlation-based univariate methods. Okay, so um, finally, lesson four. Um, again, I will have to go extremely briefly, but the bottom line is sometimes it's much more important what type of features you design than what particular classifier you use. And you probably know it from your experience too. Um, in this case, we looked at schizophrenia data and the goal was to figure out what are statistical biomarkers of the disease, what patterns are different, and we know it's not a local thing, it's a network disruption. So you start looking for network properties, you build correlation matrix of the brain, you start value threshold, you look at the network, look at the degrees, look at shortest path and other features. And bottom line, no matter which classifier you try, overall those features were much more discriminative than local activation features that are typically used in the field. Again, you use your prior and you get good results. Since I have to finish probably in a couple of minutes, I really wanted to talk briefly about a more recent project which completely changes gears and say, okay, it's all nice and we can try to read minds with a fMRI, but you cannot do it in real life. 